I always encourage the people to come at our booth and try it. Because once you try it, if you work in a specific field, you will connect the dots by yourself. I don't need to tell you anything about the technology. Easy to think and very smart. And I would have definitely not encouraged someone to buy Orleans to do that. But if you have it, then you can really push it to any possible direction inside the car to see how you look like from outside. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you never see because usually it's other people seeing you in the car. But you could look and say, well, you know, I look like stupid in this I, car. I look cool. <laughs> <laughs> or I look very cool. So mm. uh, I think it was uh, actually very interesting, the, the concept of uh, how they could reach the people. Gabriele, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and welcome at All Light. Yeah, it was kind of a pain uh, in the ass this morning to set everything <laughs> up, but thank you so much, Hololite, for setting this up. Like different views, different angles, different camera angles. Really, really cool studio that you have. Yeah, we, we, we thought that it was a good idea to have uh, our own studio and not rely all the time on different companies. Uh, mm. So uh, we appreciate that you can actually use our system, not carry around maybe all your equipment. So Especially you can, in the snow. Especially in the snow. You, you definitely choose the best day to come to Munich to yeah. visit us. Cool. All right, we always start a podcast, Gabriele, with the guest giving us a one-minute bio, roughly one minute. You can also go longer if you <laughs> no, want. No, no. But what is your background and what do you actually do at Hololite? Okay, so I joined uh, Hololite around two years ago. Uh, I have been uh, in information technology for uh, 26 years now. Uh, at the very beginning, uh, mainly for uh, um, integrating systems for large enterprises. So I, were, I was working in technology like uh, uh, server technology, uh, networking, uh, uh, email system, uh, and all the, the classic, let's say, uh, data management system for large enterprises. Mm. And then slowly I moved towards the software development um, in relation to uh, building software for design and engineering and marketing and sales solution related to high-end visualization. So uh, when I moved to Munich around 10 years ago, um, I did join uh, a large company, the so System, mm -hmm. and I've been working uh, um, in the automotive market in particular and consumer goods retail, uh, designing and developing solutions that were related to the possibility to work uh, uh, with uh, 3D data in real time uh, for um, product manufacturing and in general for uh, the whole uh, digital prototyping. And then I joined uh, Hololite around two years ago. Uh, I took over uh, the development team uh, in charge of one of the products. And slowly I took over also uh, the other classic products of Hololite, uh, specializing and uh, developing, let's say, the roadmap and uh, all the steps uh, to move uh, uh, forward the technology we have been actually developing before my joining here at Hololite uh, related to augmented reality in particular, but the XR technology in general. Mm -hmm. Why do you have a big interest in XR technologies? Do you think it's the future? Well, the thing is, uh, um, as I said, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, I've been working very close to manufacturer company mm -hmm. before uh, I've been working with any kind of enterprises. Uh, but in certain industry, for example, the way products get managed uh, and so on, um, there is a massive usage of uh, computers and technology in general. But the visualization, and in particular the high-end visualization, so uh, very high level of detail, very uh, uh, complex product with tons of parts and so on, uh, it's something that um, I got closer in the last 10 years and uh, it made very clear how um, working with the CAD, it's not anymore enough. And we had also other technology like 3D printing that made uh, the concept of taking 3D data and bringing back to life, mm. uh, looking like it was the easiest thing to do. Uh, but now with the XR technology, you can see actually that you don't even need to get to the 3D printing before you could really work and interact with this kind of uh, system. And in the future, the development of this kind of technology will become uh, one of the primary technology used in uh, many industries to do the daily job. Yeah, I think it would be interesting for the audience if they have no idea what XR is, what is the differenti differentiation between XR, AR and VR? Okay, so um, if we look, uh, uh, historically speaking, uh, we have been always dealing with uh, virtual reality. That mm -hmm. was a uh, term that probably already in the 80s, also through movies and so on, uh, became uh, uh, a very common concept for people. It's something that even if they don't know in details what it is, everyone kind of know that you have to uh, wear this uh, headset and you have this uh, sort of screen and you see an entire world uh, as a digital world recreated virtually. And uh, this is virtual reality. So everything you see in this kind of visors, 
uh, is generated by computers. So there is the environment, there is the object, there is uh, the avatars of the people, mm -hmm. uh, everything is entirely coming from um, a computer vision. But uh, moving, let's say, further in the technology, uh, we have started to develop a, a other uh, technical solutions. And the augmented reality, uh, it's actually different than virtual reality. Because uh, even if you wear a headset, mm -hmm. this is not a closed headset with a screen. This is a headset where you can see through. It's transparent. So you can still see the world around you. And you can actually impose over uh, 3D data in a way that they look like they are in the real environment. But the, uh, let's say biggest difference is that the environment itself is the real one where you are. So you can move freely. Sometimes we see videos, uh, uh, for example, in YouTube of people playing with VR mm -hmm. and they hit the furniture around their apartment and so on. In AR, this doesn't happen because you have a see-through system. XR technology, it's the combination of the two elements. So in XR, you have the possibility to switch between AR and VR and you have devices that allow you to decide which of the system you want to work giving you the possibility to interact uh, with the environment or not, depending on what you want to do. So they are uh, an extension of the both world, and they combine the possibility to work uh, uh, in different situations. So you can have the environment, you can have a see-through, you can have interaction, for example, using joystick, but you can have also, for example, the possibility to work only with your hands. Um, so it's, it's a very uh, extended way to work with both technologies. Yeah. I think you talked about extension, which I think is a good segue into how engineers actually want to use it in their product development processes, which kind of brings me to engineers are used to working on a 2D screen with a 3D geometry, so they can kind of grasp the concept of what 3D actually, what it's looking like in the real world. But where's the added benefit now of XR? Well, um, as you introduced, uh, uh, the concept of 3D, it's definitely not new. Uh, uh, CAD, computer-aided design, is existing for uh, around 50 years now mm -hmm. in general. And uh, the thing is, uh, to work with 3D data, it's uh, uh, now a reality for, I would say, the 90% of the industry uh, existing in the world. But the issue is that uh, everything is bidimensional. So there is no perception of uh, the volume of the object. There is uh, no possibility, for example, uh, to overimpose uh, a 3D data with something that is real. Uh, if you do it on a screen, usually you have a picture in the ground. And then again, you go in, in a 2D system. And actually, another thing that happens most of the time when you work just with a normal computer and even a very large screen, uh, the person interacting with the data is uh, stationary. It's in front of the screen. Mm -hmm. And they move the object in the screen to be able to see any perspective. When we look uh, at the same scenario, but wearing a XR device, what you are really doing is you are bringing to life uh, your 3D model in a way that gets displayed in a real environment with its correct size and scaling, its volume, and uh, it's not anymore the user that needs to rotate, for example, the object, but you can move around the object. So you have the feeling of a real object in a real space. And a lot of the interaction that usually you do on a screen, and they don't give you a real feedback about, for example, the shape of the object, because even if the perspective and the visual quality is very high, certain details, they will never look like, oh, this is a very rounded surface. But if you have the object in a real environment and you can see it as it is real, mm -hmm. you can actually start to uh, work uh, and think completely differently about the task that you are used to do. Uh, we have been working, for example, with the automotive industry for a long time now. And if you think about a car, the possibility to display a car in scale one to one, it means that you can have uh, a real interaction with just opening a door mm -hmm. or sitting inside the car or having a look to specific details from any perspective, but being close to the real object. So also for people that, for example, a, in the manufacturing processes, they have been far away uh, from working with uh, digital data. They have been always working with physical parts, for example, in the prototyping phase. Now they can start to have uh, the same kind of experience they are used to, but working with digital data. And this means that they can reproduce exactly the tasks they are familiar with, processes they've been tuning for a long time, 
but they can actually do it uh, with the flexibility of an object that is not real. So uh, just think about, for example, very heavy object. If you want to uh, have a look to the bottom of a very heavy object, you have in some way to lift it. Mm -hmm. uh, but in AR, the object doesn't have any weight. So you can literally take a car and put it up with your hands and look under the car without any effort. And it's definitely different because, uh, again, it's like looking at the real car. So you move from left to right, you see every detail exactly as it is if the car is there. When you rotate an object on the screen, yes, you see the underneath part uh, exactly the same way. But the thing is, uh, first of all, it's vertical in front of you. Second, the scaling, unless you have a very, very large screen, will never be one-to-one. -one. So the level of detail you can achieve and reach uh, is actually completely different. I see. When you pitch your solution to uh, prospects, what's the biggest like differentiator maybe to other XR solutions? And also, what's the ROI that they can get out of this XR technology? to unleash actually the potential of XR? Well, this is a, a very good question. Um, the, the return of investment is actually one of the most important uh, terms that we use when uh, we discuss with potential clients or new customers. Um, technology for a long time has been perceived by a manufacturing company, for example, as uh, something that you have to be careful because mm -hmm. costs usually grow over time. Mm -hmm. uh, they require a lot of maintenance. They require a lot of processes. And uh, it's very hard to really establish how much they are contributing to the step that they've been performed their entire life without any real computer system. But XR technology are actually one of the fastest uh, solution for a return of investment. Um, the time to deploy and work with this kind of technology, uh, they are very short. Just to give you an idea, uh, at Ololite, we've been focusing in trying to make uh, the implementation of our um, solution for design and engineering uh, as fast as possible to a point that if you have uh, the correct device and you have uh, our software solution, you can start to work the very first day with a very, very fast learning curve. In, uh, in no more than a couple of hours, anyone, even if they have never used any XR technology in general, they will be able to work with the software and they will be able to perform certain tasks right away. So the uh, implementation is uh, incredibly fast. And the impact of this kind of technology is massive. Uh, in particular, if we think about uh, the whole design process and the prototyping phase. Those two moments in life of a product, together also with the planning for the manufacturing, mm. um, XR bring benefits everywhere. Mm. Um, in the last 10 years, I think uh, 3D printing came with a promise uh, to reduce cost and reduce time when it comes to prototyping. You can create any parts in a very, very fast way, in a very cheap way. But still, when you think about certain products, 3D printing is still slow because it takes hours and there is still the possibility uh, that something goes wrong and you have to reprint a part. And uh, if you print a part, and you test it and it doesn't fit, then you have to update your design and then re 3 print. Uh, XR, it's a matter of seconds. You take your CAD file, you display in 3D, you precisely overlay with your real world, you take your decision, you make your evaluation, you want to change the design. Once you have the design, in few seconds, you have it there in the real world, in scale one-to-one, -one, once again, perfectly overlaid. So the whole process of, for example, developing a single part of a product and the entire product get much, much faster. And this is where actually you see uh, how big is the impact in terms of time saving. And that applies to everything that requires to handle uh, something that you have to evaluate in the real world. We have a lot of very good technology that simulate most of the aspects of everything from design to production. Uh, but certain things, you need to have it in place. You need to be there and see actually what you are dealing with. And this kind of situation is where XR actually bring a massive value because you can try to position everything. You can position an entire production plant uh, inside a, an empty space and you can see every aspect of the production 
happening with animation in real time, mm -hmm. exactly as it will be. And if you want to take any decision, it's not happening on the screen uh, with some scaling, it's happening in scale one-to-one -one in front of you. And the level of interaction is getting to a point that if you have ever seen a movie of uh, Iron Man, this is where we are getting. So this is the kind of experience that you can have. You can interact with your objects, you can do everything exactly as it would be if it's real. It's like the Jarvis surrogate from, <laughs> from the Iron Man movie. We talked about the product development process. So where actually in the product development phase would you say that XR plays a huge role? We talked about the prototype phase yes. or the manufacturing, before the manufacturing phase. Where exactly would you, maybe also <coughs> in the concept <coughs> phase? Sorry. That's also a good uh, point to start so, XR. Uh, XR technology, they really start from the very early design of any product. Because as I said, uh, as soon as uh, you have uh, any digital representation of what you are trying to build, uh, this can be displayed uh, immediately. Mm. So you don't need to do anything. You just take your uh, cut file and you can display it. And you can have a look to the product exactly as it is in real life. Moving forward, uh, every single aspect of updating the design is something that you can validate once again right away in, in a proper three-dimensional uh, sense, so again, not only to the screen. And as soon as you start to move uh, into the prototyping phase, uh, every aspect related to single parts that needs to be assembled, do they fit, do they match? First batch of production of the prototype is the physical part matching with my design. For example, in some cases, uh, um, not every company produces the first batch of parts in-house. They have third-party supplier. How can you be sure that the part they have delivered match with the original design? Mm -hmm. So those are things that, for example, they are very easy to do now because you can overlay your original cut design with the physical parts and you can check every edge, every hole, every point uh, where you have to mount uh, parts together. All those things, they can be done right away. And uh, another very important aspect, in particular, when you start to work with uh, products that they have a certain level of complexity, ergonomic study, for example. Um, again, I will take the car just because it's one of the most mm. complex product, let's say, in the world in general to create. Um, to assemble a car, uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of study, but you know, once the car is together, it works, it's there. But what about repairing? Usually when you have to repair a car, you are not disassembling the entire car. You're trying to be focused only on a specific part. And uh, uh, the ergonomic studies start from the point that, can I put together something? Do I have enough room to put my hands inside and move a tool, for example, use uh, just a screwdriver? All those kind of things, uh, they are very hard to try on a screen, for example, because uh, how much is the real space? How much are your hands big? how the tool is actually moving, is colliding with something inside the space. All these kind of things can be actually recreated exactly as they are in real life uh, with XR technology. So all this kind of ergonomic study about, can I reach some component with my hand? Do we have enough room to put my hand inside some area? And if I am inside, can I move a tool to unscrew or rescrew something? So all these kind of things, they can be tested before you create any part of the car with a certain level of precision. Collision detection, for example. Am I actually touching something while I'm grabbing something? Or are two parts actually touching something else? All these things, they can be perceived from any angle exactly as they are. And so, once again, you see how XR keep moving forward together with the process of creating the product. Mm. And then moving forward again, you go to the simulation process, for example. There are a lot of very good technology, as I said, that they can recreate through simulation a lot of information related, for example, um, to uh, water resistance, uh, wind resistance, um, all the thermodynamic uh, um, simulation related to it's something uh, getting warmer, it's something too cold, are cables touching and then reacting in some way. Also, all these things, if you think about the safety part, um, it's actually very, very easy to run a lot of this simulation with virtual products before you even try to plug two cable. If you think now with electric cars, for example, it's getting dangerous. There is a lot of power inside mm -hmm. an electric car and to plug the wrong cable the wrong way uh, could be a, a very big safety uh, hazard. 
But now you can anticipate most of this problem having you look uh, in 3D through simulation in the real world and then move uh, as far as possible the last stages that they are usually the most expensive and uh, they are the most maybe dangerous. Mm. So you finalize only when you have a certain level of security and all the aspects that you are used to take into consideration they have been already managed. Yeah. I like the anecdote that you talked about this assemb assembly of a car. I think there was one car from Volkswagen, I think it was the Volkswagen Beetle, where you have to, when you remove the front light, you have to basically disassemble <laughs> almost the whole car. So this is wh where this technology would have been very beneficial. Um, is that now that you talk about, is that a digital twin or is it something bigger, what we call the industrial metaverse? Or is the digital twin only a subsystem of this metaverse thing? Okay, uh, so first of all, maybe we have to uh, try to clarify what is the digital twin, because this is a concept, uh, we have this uh, standard in the industry, Industry 3.0, Industry 4.0, mm -hmm. and they start to introduce passwords that a lot of people they use, uh, but sometimes they don't have a real grasp of what does it mean. So uh, I think everyone can figure out that the digital twin is more or less a digital representation on, of some goods. Uh, a product, for example, again, if we talk about a car, a digital twin is the 3D version of this car. So it's something that exists only inside a computer system, but is actually a one-to-one -one representation of the physical product. But the, the digital twin in the concept of the Industry 4.0 is actually much more complicated than that. Because, uh, yes, it could start, for example, with a 3D representation of a single part, for example, a tire. But the digital twin add also a lot of information that they are connected to a lot of other systems inside the company. For example, it's not just about what you see, but is um, what materials are used for this product? Where do they come from? Who is the supplier? How they are labeled and in some way uh, stored? Where they are stored? How do I get it? Mm -hmm. um, for which model this specific tire is used? So all the technology that they are uh, usually used by any department of the company, and here maybe I drop some uh, acronym, but uh, they are, let's say, the most common uh, system, like product lifecycle management, or CRM, ERP, all this technology that they collect information from the financial aspect, from the supplier aspect, from the logistic aspect. Mm -hmm. All this information, they are connected to the same product. So the digital twin is not just uh, the visual representation of the product, but is the entire product in every aspect and characteristic connected to every single step of the journey from the design to market and the aftermarket. So for example, if I need spare parts, what spare parts are available? But again, if you go back to the car, Every single car is not available in one configuration. How many configuration? In which country? Because in certain countries there are set up that are not available maybe in a different e geographical area. So all this information, all together, they make the digital twin. Mm -hmm. Now, XR is definitely, let's say, not touching every single information of the digital twin. But it definitely starts with the possibility to pull the 3D representation of the product and connect certain information that mm -hmm. they bring value. Yeah. In the early stage of the production, in relation, for example, to have uh, uh, what we call metadata, so additional information related to parts, uh, to assembly, to configuration. And later on, for example, marketing and sales uh, uh, department, they have been working with a subset of the digital twin uh, mm -hmm. for a long time for creating, for example, marketing material. So there is uh, a journey for a digital twin that it's uh, called uh, uh, digital continuity. Mm -hmm. That they start from the very first uh, uh, sketch of the product that could be literally done on paper, you know? And it keep collecting information until you get to the very end uh, through the sales process and the after sales. Now, that's the digital twin. How the digital twin match uh, uh, the concept of metaverse this is a way, way more complex journey because uh, since the introduction of the uh, world, metaverse, uh, people are trying to figure out what actually it is mm -hmm. and how it applies to everyday life and everyday work. Um, the digital twin is for sure a very important component of the metaverse. But what is the metaverse? 
in general, the metaverse is uh, this uh, digital environment in which, for sure, in the future, we will see more and more people and company connect together. Uh, we can go back again to movies like uh, Ready Player One or things like that, in which we show that there is a, a, a second world, a digital world in which you can definitely challenge every aspect of the real world because physics can be replaced, because uh, you can create virtually everything you want. And this is definitely an open public space in which you can put together people and company. And for example, that's why you see also so much rumors about the metaverse, because the marketing company, they're definitely interested, or at least the marketing department of enterprises, they are definitely interested in being in the metaverse, because it's a new space where there are new consumers that they can target. There is people there, and you can try to provide them uh, a more direct connection to products, to services. So there is a, a massive uh, um, number of opportunity that could grow in that concept. But the digital twin, the way we think about when we talk about enterprises, it's something that uh, it's not in the metaverse the way we think. Because again, if we think about all the information around the digital twin, we are talking about sensitive data. We are talking about level of detail of products that mm -hmm. if exposed too early, someone could just make a copy and come mm -hmm. on the market before you with the same product. But still, if you think about the marketing team uh, of an automotive company, they want to show you the car that maybe you want to buy. They mm -hmm. want to give you a chance uh, to have a virtual tour of their product uh, before you go even in the store or you finalize any purchase. And that's why I was mentioning there is this concept of the um, digital continuity in which at a certain point you grab a snapshot of a subset of the information of the digital twin and you put them somewhere else. And that's where you can see the connection with mm -hmm. the metaverse, the way uh, Meta, the company, and Mark Zuckerberg, they have introduced it. But this is definitely not a picture that will affect uh, uh, every department of an enterprise. If we look uh, at the enterprises and what will be their role inside the metaverse, we have to think about something else. And that's why, for example, at Ololite, since the very beginning of the introduction of the concept of metaverse, we have been talking about industrial metaverse. Industrial metaverse is the same kind of world where you can put together people, but with the standard of the industry. It means uh, that the final consumer is not allowed there. Mm -hmm. It means that the digital twin you have access to there, it's actually full with all the information and you can interact with third party supplier or partners or collaborator in a way that you keep developing products and services, but before they get published out on the market. So it requires a complete different level of security. Mm -hmm. It requires a complete different level of devices, uh, a complete different level of software solution because what you are looking there, what you are looking for there, it's not what the end user will be interacting with. And this is where actually the concept of metaverse, it's still very under development because uh, uh, what we see today everywhere, advertised in any way, it's definitely the digital world for end users. But when we look at the industry, it's a completely different world. It will be connected but it will not definitely be what we have seen till now advertised. But potentially a customer could add or a prospect could interact with you in the digital world, basically in the metaverse. Yes, that's the point. So we are talking about a collaborative space. Yep. So people will join and will be able to interact directly more or less like they could do in the real world. Mm. But this is for sure cutting, for example, distances. It's cutting um, languages barrier or other kind of barrier that today they, they could make the communication much harder. But again, we are talking about people that they must have something in common. And the industry, they will be in between the industrial metaverse mm -hmm. and the metaverse the way it get advertised today. Because they need to have also something like the metaverse, but in which the people invited or the people that can join yep. are strictly related to the business aspect of the business of the company. Yeah. 
Maybe let's go a little bit from a higher or look at it from a higher perspective, the digital continuity. I know it from an AI perspective, when you go to a company, usually the data is everywhere. So we say that all of the people there have to care about data, but actually nobody's doing it. So when you go to a prospect or to a customer, who is actually having that 3D data? Is it in a PLM? And if they don't have a PLM, how do we actually take care of that problem? <coughs> okay, um, so the technology used uh, for the digital twin and the digital continuity, they can change depending on the size uh, of the company and uh, the complexity of the product. Uh, let's take some very simple product, a toothbrush. Um, it, of course, it requires some effort to make a proper toothbrush, but the number of parts, the number of components, they are pretty small. Uh, and uh, unless uh, you are a company that make uh, 20,000 different uh, toothbrush, maybe you don't need a very complex product lifecycle management because, again, the number of parts, the plastic, the suppliers, they are pretty limited. So there are solutions uh, for, let's say, every size of company and every level of complexity. The higher the level of complexity and the more uh, this digital process of creating the digital twin and maintaining it uh, gets complicated. Also because every department is in charge of a complete different set of information. There are departments that they see uh, the 3D data of the product very later in the stage of the product development. Um, but they are already working on, for example, supplying materials or uh, actually stocking materials and distributing materials. Mm -hmm. um, so all these technology usually they are managed by system integrators that they take care for large enterprises to create the connection between all the different pieces. Today on the market there are, I would say, between five and six uh, different standards about a digital twin provided by the largest uh, consultancy company in the world. Um, when we look at the XR technology in this, in this aspect, for example, um, the 3D data, they are usually uh, inside the product lifecycle management. In particular, again, if we talk about very complex product. Uh, this product lifecycle management, they don't just take care of uh, the structure of the product and the product itself, but they already include a lot of information related to the aspect that will affect, for example, production and manufacturing. Uh, what happens usually is that this information, they are created with CAD system and they have a very, very uh, high level of detail um, to a point that till today, the technology for the visualization of this kind of uh, uh, information, they are very expensive when you get to large uh, and complex files. We are talking about files that they have a very large size and they are very hard to compute. So you need very powerful workstation usually, you need very good graphic card, and uh, um, they require, again, a lot of computational power to be processed. What XR does, try to consume this data. So we try to get this data and display this data through mm. the devices that uh, people use. But this information, they are usually managed directly by the people that design and produce the data with the support of the IT department. So one of the biggest aspects of the digital continuity is how you can consume this data without applying new processes that can, for example, um, create overhead in the time between when you want to pick up your data and when you can consume your data. Uh, for a very long time, most of the devices on the market, they had a hard life in trying to display this data. Mm -hmm. Their computational power is very limited. If you look at devices like the one we have here around, no. uh, usually the computational power in a very small box. Uh, so they cannot um, compete with the level of detail that usually designers or engineers they are used to with the, their CAD workstation. And that introduced uh, one of the, let's say, most painful and expensive process in the digital twin. Uh, it's called the data preparation. You need to take this data, convert them in something that is much smaller, clean them, try to reduce it to the point that you can display. And for certain products, when you can finally have something that can be displayed, then cannot be used to take a decision mm -hmm. because you have lost uh, most of what you were looking for. Um, so what, what we have been trying to do and what actually Hololite has been focused on is um, get 
in a seamless way part of this process of the digital continuity, providing technology that they consume this kind of data with the level of detail expected by people that are used to work with CAT station and bring them inside XR devices with the same level of detail and with the same quality so that they can be really used for decision making. There are a lot of technology in the market that can be used also with reduced data. Uh, but this again is creating a sort of branch out of what is the digital continu continuity and is then triggering possibility of mistakes, uh, data loss, uh, data redundancy, because you start to have copies of copies of data. Um, so to introduce this technology is always a collaboration between the departments mm -hmm. that create the data and usually IT that is in charge of the infrastructure that make possible to assess and consume the data. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, depending on the size and the complexity, is usually a step-by-step -step process to learn how much they have control over consuming data directly or how much you have to be part of a process bef before to be able to do yeah. it. Do you say that when you talk to people that sometimes they feel there is an inconsistency in data because the departments have not communicated properly? Correct. So would you say that's the case? <coughs> so this uh, definitely could happen. Mm -hmm. Because again, every department is responsible of a subset. And sometimes uh, uh, the processes of the product manufacturing, they are not perfectly aligned because there are things that can happen much earlier in time mm -hmm. despite the product not being ready. Yeah. So this kind of disalignment, they always require to uh, adjust uh, and normalize data over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so this process is still not perfect, to be honest. Uh, but companies, they're really focused in trying to make the digital twin, let's say, the most accurate representation of the product. Um, if, if we think about the product lifecycle management, for example, uh, if we have engineers that will be <laughs> listening at this, I think they will definitely be able to relate to the fact that sometimes uh, the development of a product take uh, maybe longer because on the way you start to face issues that you couldn't anticipate and you get to a point in which, uh, for example, um, you cannot keep up with the rules of the system to deliver in time. So what you end up doing is that you want to solve the problem and then you will probably go back uh, and uh, make possible for the product lifecycle management to treat the product correctly. But I can tell you in the last 10 years, uh, I've been working with a lot of large uh, enterprises and there are very, very few that can really look into the PLM system and see the product exactly as it is. Mm -hmm. There is always some piece here and there that doesn't match. And this is where actually it gets complicated because this kind of information, uh, if they start from the PLM not exactly as they are supposed to be, over time, they collect more mistakes. Mm -hmm. And this is where the digital continuity, it's definitely today one of the process where the, the issue is not um, the data in terms of oh, we are missing a new technology to be able to connect the dots. But is how can we be sure that we provide a system where people can react uh, in no time and the system stay updated? How would you personally enforce that data continuity? <laughs> if you would be in charge of it, what would you do? So today I have to say that uh, it's very hard to enforce uh, uh, the digital continuity because as I said, uh, for example, uh, Let's think about something maybe even more complex than uh, a, a car. Let's take an airplane. The safety measure for an airplane, they are insane. Mm. They even change while you are building your product. So you have to keep up and keep updating things. And an airplane is not something that you're going to build in a few months. You mm. know? So it's usually uh, a quite long time before you can start the design and complete the airplane. Um, Today, the issue is that to go through all the safety measure before to say, okay, this part now it's ready and can go out, there are very well-defined and established process that they are milestones you can't skip because you can introduce very, very dangerous mistake. Mm -hmm. And to try to enforce the people to stick to this means uh, that they, they must have time. 
they must have a lot of time at their disposal mm -hmm. to be able to go back uh, and redo everything following exactly the procedure. And of course, the more complicated and dangerous the product and the more they try to do that. But the issue is that today, as I said, because parts sometimes they are very big, they are very heavy, they require a lot of time to be managed before you can take a decision. Uh, the only way you can enforce to stick to this process is to introduce new technology that can shrink the time when it comes to take decision. And that's why, for example, we can now cycle back to what you asked me in the beginning about XR, how is helping people, uh, you know, to do their job. What XR is cutting the time. Mm -hmm. And it's giving you then the time to go back and follow every step in the digital system to have the digital continuity as much as possible accurate. Because uh, every step you have been doing in real life uh, in XR can be done in a fraction of the time. Mm -hmm. And this is where then you have the time to go back and take a decision multiple times and still be able to maintain every single aspect of fit, feeding the system with all the information you need to be sure that the digital twin is correct. Yep. We, we see the beautiful devices behind, <laughs> behind of us. So you talked about the processing power of these devices. How does it actually work? What's the most current version actually? Uh, so, um, well, here we have different devices. So, for example, this is a very, very recent device that has been released on the market uh, just uh, uh, around a couple of months ago. Yeah. It's from Lenovo. And it's a, as you can see, it's a very small device uh, mm -hmm. that is actually uh, has been developed to be connected to a mobile phone. Uh, but is uh, I would say uh, it's more, let's say, for a, a consumer market right now than an industrial market because, for example, again, safety. Uh, some of these devices... Uh, they get developed with the best intention in mind in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. So they really try to squeeze in uh, the last available technology when it comes to the visual quality, to the computational power. But sometimes to achieve uh, the expectation, and that's where actually the consumer market sometimes make the situation harder, to achieve uh, the expectation that the consumer market has, sometimes uh, producers of this kind of device, uh, they don't think from the very beginning that um, enterprises will not be able to work with this device. Because, for example, some of these devices, they come with a wire. Okay, yeah. And wire is a big safety hazard for every industrial uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first uh, uh, point to always keep in mind is that for industrial usage, the device must be wireless. And you must be able to use it in a wireless way. If we come, uh, if we discuss about AR, till today uh, at Autolite, um, we believe that the Microsoft HoloLens 2, that is this device, uh, it's still the best uh, option you can pick up. Because uh, it comes more or less with all the characteristics that will give you um, very fast uh, adoption of the device, proper uh, characteristics in terms of safety and support, and uh, it's produced by Microsoft. So this means that uh, the long-term maintenance of these products is available. Uh, you can rely on the fact that this device will be supported for a lot of mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. and that the Microsoft will keep releasing update, security patch, and improvements for the technology. Uh, there are a lot of very uh, good company when it comes to mm, the last generation of devices for the market. But as I said, um, most of them, they keep in mind that the consumer market first, also because you need to eat a certain number before you will be able, of course, to reduce the prices of the technology. And, uh, and sometimes uh, this kind of device don't fit uh, with, uh, as I said, uh, an industrial usage. Because, for example, they don't come uh, with the right uh, enterprise support. So the maintenance in general, uh, it's maybe just for a very short period of time. Uh, there is no continuity of the product. We have seen a couple of companies in the past uh, that um, they released one product after the other. And like in three years, they released three devices. And as soon as there was a new device, they dropped the support for the mm. previous one. And this is not something that in a large enterprise will work. IT will be having a hard time to deal with this kind of technology. And they cannot also think about um, keep changing the device. Because for example, in the consumer market, uh, uh, let's say the leader uh, industry for um, content is the gaming industry. Mm -hmm. And the gaming industry is always running after new opportunity. The gamers, they are always looking for something new. 
But when you look at an enterprise, the adoption of a new technology, a digital technology in a process, once it gets introduced, it gets tuned over time and it becomes a system that gets used for a minimum of five years with updates, upgrades, but you keep that technology inside the company for a long time because we go back to the uh, concept of the return of investment. You need to invest and you have to be sure that you can actually have an impact on your yeah. processes. And those processes, they get designed over years to be tuned to the best performances possible. So this is definitely not a way um, industry will be able to handle what comes on the market. So despite now, I would say 2022 has been, a, let's say, a good year for new devices coming on the market. Uh, it's still not, uh, let's say, mm, the best uh, working scenario for company to figure out which device they should pick up. And that's why one of the hardest part of our job when we uh, meet some new customer is explaining why a device and not another one. Because uh, again, the consumer market is very good in the communication and they for sure push for things that they look very shiny. But then when you get to the point of working with it, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, people are disappointed because we suggest maybe a different device and, and they think it's because we have some interest in that. But the point is that it's coming really from the experience. At Ololite, we've been uh, in working with XR for seven years now and only in business environment. So we are very familiar with the limitation, with the problem, with the issue. And that's why I was mentioning wireless, uh, a certain uh, level of support, a certain level of durability, uh, maintenance. Those things are things that we are familiar because we've been talking to IT for a long time. We've been talking with departments for a long time. And to choose the right device is actually uh, very important. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the streaming technology itself now, how does it actually work? Give us an example <coughs> of maybe displaying a car. Give me a ballpark number. How many polygons are we talking about? And why is it not possible to use these devices, but you have to actually calculate on the cloud, quote unquote, okay. calculate, <laughs> and then basically stream it back to the so, device? So uh, this is where actually I would say at Ololite, we've been the first um, coming up with a better solution uh, for handling the data complexity of industry. Mm -hmm. As we were discussing before, depending on the product, the level of detail could be very high. And CAD, usually uh, CAD files, they are not, uh, they use a, a different technology to represent 3D data. Uh, these kind of devices, uh, in order to display 3D data, they need everything to be rearranged in polygons. And uh, when we talk about polygons, in this case, we are talking about a surface that has been redesigned in triangles. Mm -hmm. The number of triangles uh, define, let's say, the computational power required. Uh, we can go from few hundreds polygons to represent a very small object uh, to several hundred million when the, project is, when the project is very big and the level of detail and the number of parts is very high. Um, le again, let's talk about maybe the Microsoft Orleans that for us is one of the, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually the most important device when it comes to uh, AR till today. Uh, the computational power of the Microsoft Online 2 will allow you to load uh, a 3D object that can have around 1, 1.2 million polygons. Looks like a big number. But when you look at, at uh, for example, a full car, um, you can go easily from 90 million up. Mm -hmm. It depends how many parts you have inside, how much do you want every single surface to be perfectly rounded, so you can literally go to 100, 200 million polygons. So this is something that this device will never be able to display. And this is something that at Ololite we've been facing from the very beginning, because when we started to work with industry and they started to say, yeah, but I want to load this file, you know? Uh, okay, that's impossible. <laughs> so, um, so we came up with the idea of uh, reusing actually uh, some technology that has been on the market for other purpose for a long time streaming. Mm -hmm. We know that if it, if this design, they get created with the workstation, they can be visualized. So now the point is, uh, we just need to send uh, the same data to the device, but not to be processed, just to be displayed. So uh, we have worked for our own software, and we have created uh, a streaming technology that allows our application to run uh, on a workstation, 
on a laptop, on a cloud machine, taking advantage of the computational power of very powerful hardware, and then we stream pixels to the device. So the computational power required by the device is very low because uh, we are actually taking advantage of uh, uh, the screen capability and the sensors. So we do manage only the exchange of data in terms of detecting the hands or detecting the environment. But the whole computation gets done on a computer and then gets streamed to the device. So we have started this journey um, several years ago. And today uh, we have uh, our solution running uh, on-premise. So on your computer streamed to a device wireless or in the cloud streamed directly to your device, even with a mobile phone. Uh, being able to load several hundred million of polygons and be displayed with the level of detail you are expecting, but on a HoloLens. And uh, this is uh, today uh, the only way you can match the expectation of the digital twin consumed as it is. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, uh, the streaming technology is, uh, is a very important technology, uh, I would say, for this kind of usage. Because, uh, uh, as I said, you don't do any compromise and you can consume your data the way you design them. Mm -hmm. um, there are different solutions on the market that provide also what is called hybrid rendering or remote rendering. It's, it's a bit different from streaming. Because, for example, um, solving the problem of the computational power, we have also introduced uh, uh, two solutions to different aspects. Security. As we discussed before, mm -hmm. the digital twin is not something that you want to share with people around in an easy way. And uh, if you look at how this device works out of the box, as I said, the computational power is on the device. So usually you install an application on the device, like you will do with your mobile phone. Yep. So this means that the application runs on the device and the data, they need to be stored inside the device. And this is a massive security issue because usually uh, this kind of device, it's not that you buy one for every employee of the company. Mm -hmm. So this device, they get most likely shared between multiple people. Uh, and because you have to upload the data, and then you have to delete the data, you could always end up with someone that forget about it, or in a rush, they end over the device to someone else. Yeah. The device stays around, and there are data inside. With streaming, actually, <laughs> all the data, they stay where the computational power is. So on the computer, in the cloud, in any case, on a machine that is managed through IT policies. So there is security, there is uh, user validation. There are a lot of aspects that will already solve the problem of the data management. And inside the device, there is no digital footprint of anything, not even the application itself, mm -hmm. because the whole logic of the application runs somewhere else. And you just visualize the interaction with your data. When we go to remote rendering, that's different than streaming. Because in the remote rendering, you still have the logic of the application inside the device, and you just delegate the computational power for the visualization somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But it's something in between. So there is still digital footprint inside the device. And that's where, actually, um, we believe that streaming is the real answer uh, for the industrial metaverse in this sense. And we have been um, hard working on creating also an infrastructure that will be able to uh, support companies in hosting any XR application and take advantage of the streaming to device to be able to switch between multiple devices and keep security, safety, and uh, software management inside a very manageable system. Yep. Talk about the infrastructure. How does it actually work? You go with the Hololite, for example, Hololite to, to a company. How does the streaming work? Do they have to <coughs> set up something inside of their company to actually enable streaming? Or is it done like... No, this depends on uh, what is the setup. Because, for example, in some uh, company, the design department, they have a, a very secure network that they are even disconnected from internet mm -hmm. or disconnected from the normal network of the office. Uh, so usually we discuss with the company what kind of level of uh, security they have, what level of infrastructure they have, and what kind of IT support they have in-house. And then in our portfolio, we have the possibility to support, let's say, a different level of um, 
complexity for infrastructure. So if you just buy a normal license of the software, you can deploy it on-premise. So it means that you can just install it on your computer and through any Wi-Fi connection, uh, you can actually stream from your computer to your device. And this is something that, for example, uh, small enterprises, they can do literally in a few minutes. Once they install the software, if the computer and the device, they are in the same network, they already see each other, they can already work. Um, but in some case, for example, small enterprises, they don't have a, a very good IT. And maybe they don't have a lot of hardware hanging around where they can install or host this kind of application. Mm -hmm. and that's where we can support them, for example, with cloud machine. We have uh, uh, the same software available as a service, so they just need to buy the device, and then through any Wi-Fi connection and internet connection, okay. they can immediately uh, reach our software in the cloud and securely store their data in a private area and work directly. And as was mentioned before, uh, we have been uh, working on a streaming to make it, uh, first of all, usable also through mobile connectivity. So you could just use, uh, for example, your mobile phone as a hotspot, connect the OnLens to the mobile phone, and you could be in any place, uh, also outside of your office, and be able to reach a cloud machine and work through streaming. Uh, year after year, we keep working on the performances and the bandwidth to give the best performances with the minimum uh, possible bandwidth, so that really you can just use your mobile phone as a way to consume, uh, as I said, 100 millions of polygons like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, let's say, more uh, organized infrastructure, still the deployment is the same. You just need to deploy the application on a server or on a computer, and then be sure that through a Wi-Fi network connection, you can reach your device. But it's, uh, uh, we have been designing this in a way that, uh, uh, again, fit the best security standard. We are working with a defense company for a long time now, so you can imagine the level of uh, requests they have. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's uh, incredibly easy to set up. So even at home, you could use it right away. Yeah, interesting. When we think about maybe the, the economy of the future, the engineering economy of the future, I've talked about it to Pierre from Dive Solutions in my last podcast. Would be interesting. How do you see the future, or imagine the future to be, especially with these devices? Would, for example, a simulation or design engineer also use these devices on a day-to-day -day basis? Would you be able to represent simulation results, for example, CFD structural mechanics with these devices? Can it already be done, or how do you imagine in 10, 15, maybe 20 years? How so will this I, I, I can say that today uh, we already have pretty good technology mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, uh, making possible to achieve uh, uh, really a lot of things already today. Uh, what we are facing now, I would say, is that we are, um, despite having maybe VR devices in the consumer market for a while, now our mobile phones, they can do also augmented reality. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of devices coming on the market. Uh, but we are still in, in the phase in which people are trying to figure out what's the technology and what they can really do with it. For example, in the last year, uh, we have seen some improvement in the level of understanding of certain technology. But for example, when I joined Onolite, I remember that most of the discussion with clients, they were about uh, making them understand what was AR. Because uh, they had the concept of the AR through the Google smart glasses mm -hmm. or through the mobile phone. They didn't even know that they could use their hands to grab an object and use it. Mm -hmm. um, I had a couple of times the chance to, to talk to a few um, events and um, it was funny to see how people were surprised because, for example, we were used to, to, to do this speech in which we say, um, do it like Tony Stark, you know? Mm -hmm. And people, they didn't know they could actually grab the object. They thought it was just in the movies, you know? Because they have seen just the phone and it's a, a touch screen, so you touch, but it's not a 3D object. Now we see that more people start to understand. And uh, uh, actually, I think that one of the <laughs> Uh, most important moment will probably happen beginning of next year because I don't know if you uh, saw, but um, uh, two days ago in the evening, uh, Apple published uh, the new event uh, mm -hmm. happening uh, the beginning of January. And I, we all think it's going to finally be the moment in which they announce their take in the XR world. And uh, I think that will be a very, very changing moment because uh, Apple has been very good in telling everyone how to use the technology to the next level. Mm -hmm. So 
if it's really happening that they're going to announce some XR device, despite what will be and who is targeting, that will be the first moment in which people will start to be knowledgeable about the technology, what it's going to do, and how we can help them. And I think this will define also in the future how industry will start to work with this because they will definitely have more trust in the fact that this technology can be really used. Uh, we still see a lot of people sometimes thinking that it's a very fancy technology. It looks cool. It's actually great to show, for example, for marketing events, mm -hmm. but they don't believe they can uh, really use it to work. And that's actually uh, probably one of the biggest lie because uh, um, we have been working with a lot of clients, changing their way uh, to work, introducing XR technology. And uh, today, the biggest challenge for them is to um, tell people, hey, stop to do things physically. Mm -hmm. You can do that through a digital prototype. Uh, in the manufacturing in particular, when it comes to prototyping, people have been used to create, you know, mock-up uh, with any kind of material, clay, um, fabrics, uh, because they had to see what was the product. And uh, there is still a lot of people that they don't believe uh, through a digital representation, you can have uh, the same kind of feedback before the very, very last uh, moment in time in which then a physical prototype will make the difference. Yeah. And this is where in the future we will see more and more people uh, having a good understanding that this technology is a game changer. Um, it will definitely become a huge part of the world design and development. Uh, we, we definitely believe that AR in particular it's going to be a game changer. VR is going to be, in any case, uh, let's say a big player. Mm -hmm. That's where XR in general is going to be the solution once you will have better devices that will be able to switch between uh, AR and VR in a, in a very easy way. And you will see more and more people in any kind of industry. Because today, for example, uh, something that we have seen happening, and it's a great message in general about how this technology is reliable, the medical industry has finally got the approval, for example, in the US from FDA to use augmented reality during surgery. They can display data over a human body during a surgery. So this is where we are getting. And uh, there is more and more coming in this sense once the people will start to understand how much things you can do. For me, it's always fascinating because uh, we had a couple of clients that they purchased the software to address a very specific engineering case. And then we have seen them using the other, you know, using the device once they have it to do things that I, I wasn't thinking about. And it could look like the most, uh, uh, let's say, wasted amount of time and money, but it's actually incredibly smart. Um, because they already had the software and the ordinance, uh, they used it to see if uh, the pallet they use to transport the, uh, the goods could go through the door. Mm -hmm. They just put it and it scaled one to one. They went through the door. They didn't measure the door. They went with the part and said, yeah, it, it, it could fit. And I thought, well, okay, that's actually easy to think and very smart. And I would have definitely not encouraged someone to buy a to do that. But if you have it, then you can really push it to any possible direction and it's gonna work. During COVID, I still remember one of our clients uh, um, was having a hard time because it, was, it wasn't possible to travel for them. So they couldn't show their products to clients. So they, they purchased our software to start to work on a few aspects. And then they had an idea. They said, okay, we cannot travel. So they loaded the product in their HoloLens and they shipped the HoloLens to the client and say, hey, have a look to the product. And then they shipped back the HoloLens mm. and again, this will in the future not be required because more company will have it and the collaboration process, for example, in the concept of the metaverse will make possible for people to interact from large distance with products right away uh, with no need to do this kind of thing. At Ololite, we've been uh, creating multi-user experience uh, since uh, three years now mm -hmm. in which people can work from a remote location and work on a product together grabbing a, p a part and handing it over to someone else and taking decision from far distance in front of something that is just a, a hologram. And 
This is happening since three years for us. So you can imagine what's going to be in the future. I would be interested, you uh, clarified some points during this podcast, and I would be interested in how do you make a decision between decision makers and the actual user? What's beneficial for them? What would they like to know? For example, the engineer maybe that's using the whole light too. What's important for this engineer? And what's important for the decision maker? We talked about RI in these kind of metrics. <coughs> well, um, so for the decision maker, uh, this kind of technology, as I said, it's the fastest way to take a decision uh, at certain point in time during uh, the product development. It's, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's giving you direct access uh, and uh, the possibility to rework on the data in re almost in real time, keeping uh, the short amount of time you have to take a decision, um, everything in focus. Because, uh, uh, again, you take a design, you have a look into it, there is something wrong, the designer can fix right away the design and you can, in the same session, have a look right away again, if now that match. So, in terms of uh, decision taking, uh, every aspect where interacting with part of a physical product and part of a digital product uh, can be combined, it's no brain, uh, one of the fastest way to take decision. Uh, for people that are actually working with it, uh, again, let's go back just to the designer. Uh, in, again, no time, you have right away the possibility to see how your design fits with the world. And this, again, it's about going away from making a lot of fancy picture that you render and you submit to someone and you take decision around something uh, that is flat and you can show everyone what is your product right away and you can make changes in a much, much more efficient way. Um, I haven't shared this uh, information before uh, during the podcast, but for example, um, last year, um, one of our historical clients, uh, BMW, they, they, they have done some research in uh, how the technology uh, we have uh, uh, deployed at BMW was impacting their development mm -hmm. process. And they took as an example a brand new vehicle, so something that they have never uh, had before. So starting from the very early design, not having anything they could reuse. And this is a process that between, let's say, the very early idea and the time to market could take till four years. And they did uh, some measurement and they were able to establish that using XR technologies, they could cut one year of design time. So this is just to tell how the impact is massive in any aspect. And this is uh, thinking just about the time in terms of really looking at the whole design process. But if we look at the prototyping phase, the cut in costs, not just because of the time, but because of material, is even more impressive mm -hmm. because we had products in which we, we have seen the same part being developed six, seven, eight times before to get to the final stage. And now you produce two of them. And the first six, they are just digital representation. So um, it can help in every aspect of the design and engineering. So I'm, I'm really encouraging everyone, if you haven't tried, at least to have a look whenever you have a chance to this solution because uh, it fits uh, with tons of processes. And uh, we can go also in many other directions. Think about training. One of the most, uh, let's say, uh, common requests we get is, can I use this to train people to work on something that's not yet existing? And sure. yes, you can. Mm. So the point is, you could even train people about assembling something before the product gets in any way produced. Mm -hmm because you can have right away access to every part and all the aspects. You can simulate everything. And as you said before, also the simulation part is growing and growing. The technology for visualization, they are getting better and better. Mm -hmm. With the introduction of the artificial intelligence, we have seen tons of company coming with new way to process information. And the combination of all these elements, they are making everything easier and faster. And I think it's very important to let people understand one thing. Those technologies, they are not taking away job. 
Mm-hmm. They are actually giving people more chances to create greater product in a way, way shorter and cheap and cheaper, say, uh, option. So it's a, it's a massive game changer for the industry. Very cool. So it's also augmenting people, like the name, augmented reality. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Worst word play during this podcast, but well, yeah. You know, again, you can augment everything. So as I said, for uh, I'm pretty sure that Apple will uh, have a very good take about giving people the chance to interact with the rest of the world mm-hmm. in, a, in a smarter way. Mm-hmm. They have done it with, uh, with the smartwatch, they've done it with the iPhone. And uh, I think they will have for sure a take about giving people uh, chances to uh, see things differently. And that's why we believe that that will have also a much higher impact in the industry in general to understand that this is not a fancy technology. Yeah. This is a real game changer. And I don't want to say it's more impactful now than 3D printing, um, but we are very close uh, and will take over. So um, there is no doubt that uh, it's gonna be the, the main technology for a lot of industry in, uh, in every aspect. Still marketing and sales, to be honest, because uh, let's not forget that a few years ago, Audi, I think, was the first company uh, making a, a store, I think, in London, mm-hmm. in which uh, uh, they didn't have any car. They had only screen, uh, projector, uh, VR devices. And uh, I, I do remember that uh, it was one of the stores that was selling the highest number of cars. Really? You can yeah. I would actually f- assume that the consumer or the end user actually would like to have this haptic feedback of the product. So why did they actually make the most sales in the store? Well, the thing is that uh, I think it's uh, really related to the target audience you have. Because uh, uh, there is for sure a lot of products people are getting used to, for example, through the online shopping and so on, to not have direct uh, access to it, but rely on the fact that the pictures and what they get is actually already displaying the product and their characteristics. If you think about all the different uh, platforms that are around, uh, you see the product from every aspect. And for example, I've been working in the eyewear industry uh, for a while before uh, to join online. And uh, the concept of the virtual mirror uh, for consumer to be able to wear glasses and also for other, um, let's say, fashion uh, company in relation to clothes and so on, has been always a, a bit challenging because uh, uh, there is a still this need to show that the fabric is good, that the quality of the product, uh, that the sizing is actually fitting. But on the other side, the inventory is usually pretty massive. Again, if we go back to the eyewear, uh, there are uh, hundreds of products. Every product comes with multiple colors, multiple kind of lenses. And to really uh, store all this inventory in, in, a, in a shop mm-hmm. means that you need like three times the surface. Uh, so the concept of the virtual mirror was supposed to give you the chance to the user to try any possible combination and then get only the final product maybe later on. Uh, or think about the customization. How many companies, also in the footwear industry, for example, Adidas, Nike, they have introduced the concept of customizing your products and you have only a digital representation in the beginning and then you will reach, the, you will receive the product later on. So. If you really look at the target, I think that there are a lot of potential customers that they are starting to accept this concept of um, really touching the product only uh, later in time. Also because the brand identity. Think about how much companies they are investing in um, trying to establish their level of quality through the brand identity. Mm -hmm. So once you have built the trust, uh, then people will have less the need to get the product. And in worst case, they they can always ship it back. Maybe not with a car, but in general, I would say that, for example, the new generation, if you think about the shift uh, from electric car, um, autonomous driving, they are looking to a completely different product. And that's where I think uh, you can have a audience that trusts the brand. They see the product as close as possible to what's going to be, and, and they're going to buy it. I, I do remember one thing, uh, actually, that was very uh, interesting about this uh, store. Already at the time, they had this uh, um, very early uh, technology of 3D scanning a person and they were adding you inside the car to see how you look like from outside. (laughs) And this is something that you never see because usually it's other people seeing you in the car. But you could look and say, well, you know, I look like stupid in this car. I look cool. (laughs) Or I look very cool. So Mm. 
uh, I think it was uh, actually very interesting, the, the concept of uh, how they could reach the people. Nice. Let's see what the future brings. And talking about the future, what will come for Hololite in 2023? Okay, um, so our first focus, uh, um, as I was mentioning also before, is uh, to move forward with this concept of the industrial metaverse. Uh, we have last year launched uh, our last product called XML, mm -hmm. and it's this cloud infrastructure in which software developer uh, can uh, deploy their XR application and they can take advantage of our streaming technology right away. And uh, uh, the industry, uh, they can get benefit out of this because uh, uh, today there are different software vendors created XR application for different purposes. Uh, but each and every one chooses a different technology, a different device. And uh, with XR now, we are making possible uh, for enterprises to have one single repository of XR application, it doesn't matter what's the device, and they will all be automatically supported by our streaming technology. So this is our main focus. We are trying to push this technology uh, forward as mm -hmm. much as possible, uh, because we see that now that the interest in this technology is growing, the confusion and the amount of device and technology available is uh, creating again an overhead for IT discouraging sometime uh, the adoption of some solution. And we believe that with this new concept of having one infrastructure that can host all the application and all the device uh, in a seamless way, it's going to be uh, one of the additional component of the digital twin story and the industrial metaverse in general. Mm -hmm. uh, and for our, let's say, regular product like Ares, the um, augmented reality engineering space, and our streaming technology, of course, uh, uh, we are working, first of all, to complete and extend the use cases and the business cases we support for designers and engineers. We are introducing new functionality to push even further the level of interaction with the different holograms and the way you can combine holograms in the real world. We are extending, for example, uh, we are the first company uh, on the market making available a the same software for AR and VR in a way that you can have also multi-user experience with two different devices. Mm -hmm. So someone wearing an AR device can work with someone wearing a VR device on the same data together in a collaborative way. Uh, we are introducing also new technology to allow people to uh, record, for example, um, training material and video material with holograms to uh, create, for example, uh, again, marketing material, training, um, to enable people to work with XR technology uh, through mobile devices, for example. And we are constantly working in making visual quality and performances the highest possible, despite the complexity of the model. So it's going to be uh, a very interesting year in terms of how we're going to push forward the technology. And hopefully, uh, also the collaboration and the partnership we have established with some of the uh, player in the market uh, creating new devices, um, it's going to give us also the opportunity to extend even uh, to other industry this uh, solution in a way that it's going to be beneficial also for them. Very cool. I think there will also be 100% coming up a question of where do you actually get resources in terms of you want to get to a level where you understand AR, XR, and VR. What would you recommend people to do, especially maybe students who are interested <coughs> in the technology? Well, the thing is, uh, um, today, the biggest player uh, in terms of uh, uh, visualization for this kind of technology are the game engine, like Unity 3D mm -hmm. and Unreal. Yeah. They have been, uh, uh, I would say, the two main player when it comes to create application for this kind of device. And uh, the, the good thing is that uh, you can have free access to that. They provide uh, tons of material on a uh, um, platform like YouTube to learn about how to use it. Uh, the biggest challenge is to get a device, to get your hands on a device and start to get familiar uh, with uh, what the device does and what is possible with it. Uh, and today, I would say that uh, a lot of companies, they have worked, Meta, for example, to try to create devices that they are affordable. So if you think about the MetaQuest 2 that we have here behind, mm -hmm. um, it's it's still an expensive device, but it's um, uh, around between 300 and 400 euro. And it's a good investment in terms of uh, learning and 
getting familiar with the technology and understanding what's the potential. Uh, it's a very good device, for example, because it is a VR device, but you can work without the controller, for example. You can just use your hands. And that's where we are trying to encourage the people to go. Um, VR devices with controllers, it's good, but we want to teach people about doing what they do in real life uh, through any XR technology. Mm -hmm. So definitely choose a device which can have your hand tracking and, um, and start to have a look into the different applications that are available to learn. And then, as I said, uh, YouTube is definitely the place where to go yeah. to see also what is available. A lot of company, they, they showcase uh, um, different software, uh, different usage. Uh, but it's a technology that you have to try. That's a, that's a message for the consumer, but it's a message also for the industry. As I said, I'm used to, s to say this at the very end. For example, when we go to some event, um, a couple of months ago here in Munich, we were at Bauma, mm -hmm. the biggest uh, uh, architectural engineering and construction event in the world. And um, I, I've been on the stage to make a speech about XR technology. And usually I don't bring with me any video material or picture from my application, or at least uh, all light application. Because I don't like the idea that people think it's something that I have created, you know, to in some way tease them. Mm -hmm. I always encourage the people to come at our booth and try it. Because once you try it, if you work uh, in a specific field, you will connect the dots by yourself. I don't need to tell you anything about the technology. You will wear it, you will play two minutes, and then you will start to think that you can use it. And this is where the, the, the real suggestion from my side is uh, find a place where you can try it. And don't just look at material online. Uh, sometimes places like Media Market or Saturn, they have the device. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't afford it, go and play there. But seriously, uh, try it. When you try it, don't focus on what you see right away, because again, games, uh, some application get developed with a specific goal in mind. So it will not maybe 100% fit with what you think, but try to understand what you are actually uh, experiencing and then connect the dots. It's possible. You nice. can use it. Really cool. When people want to build their own applications, is it coded in C Sharp? Well, for example, if you use uh, uh, Unity 3D as a game engine, uh, yes, you can definitely use C Sharp as a language to develop. But uh, I would say uh, it depends by the platform, because, for example, you can build also uh, AR application for mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And for uh, um, technology like Apple, for example, Swift, it's a very easy language also to yep. use. And you can already start to actually understand, because you can interact with the space. You can actually get familiar with some of the technology about mm -hmm. the localization of the object. Um, so it's already a starting point. Uh, but in general, for sure, C Sharp, it's the beginning. Um, same with uh, Unreal. Uh, Unreal from uh, Epic Game, the Unreal Game Engine, uh, will let you build, uh, for example, a uh, VR application in a, in a pretty easy way. And, um, and you can still use, uh, you, you don't need to be a, a very high-end developer before to be able to build something. Microsoft, for example, okay, the OLS, it's a bit expensive. I would say it's not very affordable for the consumer market. Uh, but Microsoft, for example, provided tons of uh, utility to help you set up the first uh, uh, demo scene and be able to have a basic interaction, even if we you, you know almost nothing about uh, software development. Mm. So cool. it's, it's getting easier in general to, to, to create also application for people that they are just trying to experience what it is. Perfect. I think in, uh, we had now one and a half hour of a podcast. We, <laughs> we talked about a lot of topics. I hope the audience will enjoy it. Maybe leave your comments down below and you can check out the Hololite website. But Gabriele? Thank you very much. Really, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the questions. Sure. It was a really nice interview. And also thanks to the man behind the camera <laughs> for setting everything up. And I uh, hope you like it, guys. Leave a comment down below what you would like to know and uh, visit the Hololite website. And of course, uh, of course, through you. But uh, if anyone wants to do more, uh, they can reach me. So Definitely. I would be happy also to follow up. Uh, if you have people asking for more details, I'm always available. Sounds good. All right. With that, we'll wrap awesome. it up. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.